In May 2022, the famous philosopher, scientist and moralist Noam Chomsky went on leftist journalist Owen Jones's podcast and essentially blamed the war on American interventions. The State Department officially stated that in the negotiate in the period up to the invasion, the U.S. refused to consider any Russian security concerns. Okay. In Chomsky's view, Russia's security grievance is caused by successive U.S. administrations breaking that promise to not expand NATO one inch to the east were ignored. While Putin stated goals in Ukraine, demilitarization, neutralization, were exaggerated by the U.S. propaganda system to seem less legitimate than they were. Meanwhile, the U.S. rode roughshod over Ukraine's desire for peace with its aggression. Neighbor. The record all the way through is the Ukraine seeking some kind of peaceful settlement, the U.S. refusing to accept it, and in fact moving the opposite direction to undermine it, and Britain, of course, Blairist Britain, politely shining Washington's shoes. In this view, the war is largely a product of American actions imposed on Ukraine and Russia. Here is Jeffrey Sachs, the economist and public policy expert. Jeffrey says that the American neocon project of creating a unipolar American world, which is what led to NATO expanding right up to Russia's border, is in good part responsible for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The explicit goal was to surround Russia in the Black Sea. President Putin came in. He was not anti-European. He was not anti-American. What he saw, though, was the incredible arrogance of the United States, the expansion of NATO, the wars in Iraq, the, the covert war in Syria, the war in Libya against the UN resolution. So we created so much of what we're facing right now through our own ineptitude and arrogance. There was no linear determination. It was step-by-step -step US arrogance that has helped to bring us to where we are today. That's the left. But what about the old left? The old left is sociologically different from the left, but it largely uses the same arguments. If the left is driven by traditional critiques of US imperialism, the old left is driven by participation in the culture wars and responsiveness to the crisis of trust in public institutions in the West. So it's here goes the evil American empire again versus our institutions are corrupt and we can't trust anything they do anymore. Here is Tulsi Gabbard. So what we're seeing play out now is essentially a proxy war. Uh, U.S. is engaging in a proxy war with Russia, waging this war using the Ukrainian military and people as their chess pieces in this geopolitical um, chess game. The ultimate objective being regime change with Russia. They're all arguing that since the war was America's to start and profit from, it is also America's to end. A key facet of the Western left's critique is that it is possible to off-ramp, that opportunities for peace have been missed and sabotaged, and that a solution is still available if we pursue negotiations and diplomacy. Here is economist and public intellectual Richard Wolff. My conclusion and that of many around the world, stop it, end this war, sit down the two sides, work out an acceptable agreement, anything is safer and better for the world than continuing down the unknowable dangerous path that we are now on. And here is Chomsky again. Possibly there's one way to bring the agony to an end quickly. That's negotiations and diplomacy. There's no other way. That means in this case, offering Putin some kind of escape hatch, some way to get out without admitting total defeat. That's diplomacy. Well, if you reject it, you're carrying out a grotesque experiment, gambling with the lives of Ukrainians, and in fact the world. And that's the experiment that the US and Britain are undertaking. Chomsky has roots in Ukraine. His father was born there. 
and he is a significant intellectual outside the realm of politics and some of the other people maybe people you admire you have a relationship with but they are not right first most centrally they are misreading why putin invaded ukraine and because they are misreading why the war began they're unable to understand the ongoing dynamics driving the conflict so let's go back to putin's december 2021 ultimatum and the causes of the war everything we've seen from the left and from the old left tends to capture the causes of the war in terms of russia's national security as expressed in putin's ultimatum but in reality it's a lot more complex than that there are two primary explanatory pillars driving the causation of the war and actually neither of them can be mapped onto NATO expansion. Let's start with the first pillar, regime security. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and the full-scale invasion in 2022 were done in good part to avert regime erosion at home. In the pre-2022 world, Putin was playing president by outsourcing his presidential powers to his court and then arbitrating, refereeing conflict within his court. And at one point he felt that his refereeing powers had shrunk and to gain them back he thought he needed war. There is another factor. Putin felt that the younger generation was drifting away from him and he could put a lid on top of them via a war. Putin hoped, and he still does, that a big conflict against the West, a militarization of Russian society, will allow him to skip a generation, bringing it about that today's Russian children grow up to become Putin supporters. The second pillar of the explanation for war is about national security, kind of, but not in the way our leftist heroes would have us believe. Putin's conception of national security is both more radical and more mystical than their understanding allows. Between 2010 and 2014, Putin developed a sense of mission and Putin, the amateur historian, began making self-aggrandizing ventures into the past, looking for role models for himself. And he came to think, perhaps al Tsar Alexander III, that he was special. He got the feeling that Russia's cultural destiny was now tied to the will of a single individual, Mr. Putin. This sense of mission came years after the 2007 speech at the Munich Security Conference. There, Putin too wanted to reject the post-Cold War European settlement, but his later rejection of it took on a more mystical quality. The left, and to be fair, many in the West, deal with the Putin regime as though it were Brezhnev, whereas in fact it is closer to being something like a radical terror organization invoking holy values to justify violence. But here we have to concede a point and allow nuance. NATO expansion was handled badly and Western leaders like Bill Clinton knew that when they were doing it. Before we tackle this, let's clarify the infamous not one inch to the east promise. Was there a promise? Promises were made repeatedly, but they weren't formalized. So here is my analysis. A politician can promise another politician something by saying it, but a state cannot promise another state something without formalizing it on paper. And when we look at the formality, we see that the Kremlin signed a treaty explicitly allowing the expansion of Article 5 eastward. When Putin says that Russia got fooled, he is half right. Mr. Gorbachev got fooled because he was an extraordinary leader and a poor negotiator. But the Soviet Union, being a state, didn't get fooled because states don't make promises to each other that aren't on paper. And what then followed was that the East European countries wanted to run away from Moscow and join their own security allies. Because when Russia invaded Ukraine and nearly took Kiev, in 2022, this wasn't the first time. There was Budapest in 56, there is Prague in 68, and there is Poland in 81, when there weren't Russian tanks in Warsaw, but they were 
Polish tanks ordered from Moscow. But as Mary Serrat argues in her path-breaking book, the problem wasn't that NATO expanded, the problem was how NATO expanded. For example, there was a possibility of a more rapid but more diffuse expansion, which is what Clinton wanted, partly because it would avoid creating a line by leaving Ukraine on the wrong end of it. Either way, as Mary Serrat argues, nothing was more conducive to radicalizing Russia than expanding NATO in small tranches. But while this radicalized Russia, NATO expansion is not a primary cause of war. Centering it doesn't account for the domestic regime security causes of war. And as we have seen, reducing Putin's sense of mission to grievances about NATO expansion over instrumentalizes his worldview. We are not looking at a guy who wants to alter a couple of moves on a board game. We're looking at a guy who wants to take the board game and throw it off the table. And there is something else that the NATO expansion did, it argument implies, and that is that Putin's imperialistic death spiral serves Russia's national interest. But any thinking Russian should know that Putin's actions are destroying Russia's future and increasing the odds that Russia may not exist at all. And there is an even more striking omission in that argument, and that is Ukrainian agency. Since 2014, Ukraine has come together in a civic bond powered by anti-colonial sentiment. And it's only an ungrounded newspaper clipping approach to political understanding that could lead Noam Chomsky to say that Ukraine wants peace more than weapons. Likewise, both Putin's sense of regime security and his sense of mission are not compatible with an off-ramp. My interpretation is that Putin wants a big war against the West, but in several years from now. Meanwhile, he wants a low-level, minimally globalized war, during which Western support for Ukraine exhausts itself and Western democracies begin to collapse. And then, Putin can act from a position of strength. The left's strongest case is the risk of global nuclear Armageddon. A nuclear war could break out in a week, in 30 days. We, we are staring over the precipice of that nuclear brink now more than ever before. It would spark World War III, and the result of that is destruction of the world. My own assessment is that Russia indeed poses a high global nuclear risk. This is the left's strongest argument, but I have a couple of responses. One, the Biden administration has been extremely conservative at nuclear escalation management. That is why we've seen with each new weapon given to Ukraine, first a toe in the door, then two toes, then three, and then eventually a small quantity of weapons is delivered. Second, Ukraine retaking Crimea would increase global nuclear risk. But Ukraine not retaking Crimea, Ukraine not retaking its territories, Ukraine, God forbid, losing Kiev, which is currently impossible, would actually lead to massive Russian escalation and high nuclear risk. However we weigh nuclear risk, we are exchanging nuclear risk today for nuclear risk tomorrow. There is no nuclear risk-free way of standing up to Putin's imperialistic aggression. And now we're getting to the elephant in the room. We need to zoom out and look at the left's relationship with America. Here is the humanist public intellectual and presidential candidate Cornel West causally centering American imperialism in the run-up to the war. NATO is a instrument of American imperial foreign policy. We've seen it over and over again, and so we're witnessing a proxy war. There must be a they view all U.S. action abroad as imperialist, and in some cases as a product of U.S. corporate capitalism. Their views are profoundly U.S.-centric. They think two things. First, 
imperialism is always bad. Second, their working implicit definition of imperialism is American centric. Imperialism just is what America does abroad. Paradoxically, their US centric anti imperialism blinds them to the horrors of Russian imperialism. And it also blinds them to the constructiveness of US power in Ukraine. What they miss about imperialism, if we call the United States an empire, is that not all empires are equally bad and some global problems cannot be solved without the projection of imperial power. US imperial power is the only vehicle for stopping Mr. Putin's aggression. The truth is that the US empire is good and bad and we need it to be good and it is good now in Ukraine. While Russian imperialism is, as we have seen, irredeemably nihilistic and caught up in a destructive and self-destructive death spiral. The bottom line is that in denying the agency of other countries, in over-exaggerating America's indeed pervasive hand in everything, the leftist heroes of our video end up paying US imperialism a compliment in reverse. In lampooning American power in such a reductionist way, Noam Chomsky and our other heroes fall into the very American eccentrism they're trying to critique. But that's not a reason to cancel them. So what do we have to say in defense of those we have critiqued? First, many on the left do not share the mistakes of the heroes of this video. Ask a Polish or a Ukrainian leftist about the realities of Mr. Putin's imperialism and they'll tell you what's up. Second, it would be unhealthy to have nobody in the position that is always opposed to all US war making. If you support Ukraine, your opponents on the soft on Putin Western left could be your allies another day. Three, the alt left's warning about collapsing trust in our institutions is valid. And it's healthy if they remind us that in principle, a correct policy abroad could become wrong if it destabilizes democracy at home. Four, we share a table of politics and we don't get to win an argument by declaring that we've won it. That said, the left's poor analysis costs. It costs us, it costs our democracy, it costs Ukraine, it costs Eastern Europe, and it even costs Russia. It would be a catastrophe for Eastern Europe and for the West if a part of Eastern Europe were lost to a tyrant sitting atop an imploding empire. Putin threatens our national security, not just Ukraine's, and we need to plan and strategize accordingly. Now, an obvious question coming out of all this is how on earth did Russia end up in this disastrous place? To understand the cultural and historical journey that got Russia here, watch this video next.